I just very briefly, because I'm dying to get in on this. We had ran a, an Apprentice of the Year awards for the first time last year. The winner of the overall award was Brian O'Reardon, who's uh, doing plumbing in, in designer group, who was in his 50s. Brilliant. And he had started, you know, and he, was, he, and he was outstanding, but he had had a previous career, lots of life events, and then had decided to go and do his an apprenticeship. And so impressive, That's hugely impressive. And he, he, he won the overall Apprentice of the Year award last which year, isn't which an is a great message and a yeah. great message yeah. for people. Absolutely. Sorry, Maria. No, I was just going <laughs> to jump in there and say, I suppose from the DCCI side as well, you know, we're very conscious about um, accessibility and its accessibility for graduates, its accessibility for people maybe that have just come to our Ireland, it's accessibility in a number of different ways, and I suppose part of that will be about us building up career pathways and showcasing that, um, I suppose, case studying and, and, you know, and, and showing the really practical examples of how that can work. And really, I suppose, that the, the Design and Craft, uh, sorry, the Design and Crafts Council Ireland Academy that we're launching tomorrow, it's, it's really about bringing that accessibility to people. And I think just to go back to an earlier point as well, it's the, you know, that onboarding, you're absolutely right, I think, when you've got your own business and you know it inside out, you know the pressures that you work to, etc. But, you know, to bring somebody in there, you know, often there can be a sense of I don't have the time to train somebody, yeah. but it's actually about providing a service or providing um, a facility to help businesses to onboard, to help businesses to um, bring in an apprentice and to, and to show them and to teach them. So it's almost like, you know, showing and teaching yeah. how to be the teacher there. And I think that's something that we're very conscious of and certainly we're looking forward to working very closely with Mary Liz on that. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Yeah. So I suppose just in terms of uh, Mary Liz, just to speak a little bit about the shared apprentice model and what that could potentially look like for the craft community. Mm. So when I joined uh, the DCCI, I have the, um, the idea that I, I, I would like to be part of a launch uh, of um, an apprenticeship program that is multidisciplinary so that we may find, for example, in the wood turning, uh, we may find um, similarities or synergies with another trade, as it were, where we could actually combine that to create something that then could go out to market to be more accessible to a, a, a wider audience, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But what I hear of what you're saying um, previously is that the apprentice could be taken on, for example, in wood turning or woodworking and could travel across different businesses. Is that correct? It, in the same, yeah. It would always lead to a, a, a one occupational qualification. But for example, say for instance, if Emmett wanted to take on an apprentice but maybe felt you know, he didn't have the time or the, you know, the range to kind of do the entire program, that he would partner up maybe with another employer or another two employers and the apprentice would complete sections of their training, on-the-job training, with maybe two or three employers. We've piloted it a few years ago in the construction industry. You know, it worked. Oh. Um, it didn't really take off, but I think it's definitely something we haven't forgotten about because we've got that feedback, um, you know, that for micro-employers in particular, that is something, and particular kinds of industries, that's something that was much more feasible and realistic than maybe committing to taking on somebody solo, you know, for a two-year period or a three-year period. Um, so, you know, um, you know so, so, so that's certainly something I think, you know, would be really worth exploring. So I think perhaps you know we could find a home for something like that in the in the new uh, design and craft academy. Um, that it, you know it, it doesn't constrain the makers; it gives them scope and it allows them to share the apprentice across the disciplines, and that would then be reflected in the modules that we would teach. Um, so in fact, it would be a multidisciplinary program and approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that would take a lot of pressure off of one employer to say I have to commit for four years to yeah. this. Yeah. I think the the apprentice will get a much bigger range, a much bigger, broader thing. And the other big fear of an employer taking on apprentices, and particularly in, in the craft sector, is they'll see them as a competitor. In five years' time they'll set up on their own. They're down the road, oh I learned from him and and that's one of the fears as well. And it's it's sad to see it because if that happens the skills are going to die. They're going to whatever. And I do think it's probably work with the Heritage Council is based down in Kilkenny, Heritage Crafts, the 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 momentum of handing on skills, I think that's amazing. And it should be the pr predominant thing of it, but also that we're training people to get into industries. And as I said, it's a tough industry to be in, 
and you need many, many different skills apart from just doing your own making, you have to learn a number of different things, the, the, the skill of selling, the skill of marketing, the skill of communication, the skill of teaching, of passing on your skills to someone else, yeah. and how do you communicate all those? So I think by moving around with other craftspeople in the country, I think it has huge potential to grow, and it might be a pilot that could work very, very well. It could fit in quite well with the whole design academy that, that's being set up and things yeah. like that. No, I, I think that, that, that could be really exciting. And the other thing is we're doing a lot of work on what we call kind of pre-apprenticeships. So these are kind of taster programs and we're working with second level and transition year to kind of start building, you know, courses that give it, you know, a taste of what an industry is like. And that's where maybe that original multidisciplinary idea could be really powerful, Mary Jo, where you would have maybe, uh, you know, students could choose to maybe do a bit of wood turning, oh. a bit of, you know, um, uh, turning, you know, pottery say a bit of fine art, a bit of uh, manufacturing of, of clothing or weaving, you know, and you could get a taster going and then that would help people then decide what were they really interested in and, you know, what would be their next step. And I think there'd be a lot of interest in that because what my sense is that there's an awful lot of young people and older people out there who would love to find a way into, this, into the design and craft industry but just don't know where to start or how to do it. Um, so, you know, it could be really, really good. Yeah. Melis, I'm interested as well, you spoke about obviously the need to keep skills relevant and current and updating curriculum and um, I suppose having that being industry led is incredibly important but what is the process for that or how do you how do you actually get that research in? Yeah, so so we so people do it in kind of different ways. In some instances, there's some you know, like for example, there's you know there was the together by design and winning by design studies that were done, which is kind of on the design side. Yeah. I'm sure there are others on the craft side. There's existing studies, and then a lot of um, groups would maybe do a survey. You know, they just yes. survey employers and they you know work, work that up. And there's a lot of different models out mm -hmm. there and examples, and gather that you know just to get that sense of is there an appetite here? Would it an, an apprenticeship be sustainable because it takes a bit of work Absolutely, and effort. Yeah. There's up to like there's a good grant available to develop an apprenticeship up to eighty thousand euro from the Fantastic. state, which is you know that means you can take on somebody to develop the curriculum. Great. So it's not as if it all has to be done, you know, from existing resources. So so that's good. Um, and we have an online proposal form which kind of steps people through you know, very clearly, you know, what's, what's required. Fantastic. Yeah, and we have a handbook as well that we just published this month, just Brilliant. helping people, you know, work their way through the process. That's fantastic. Yeah. So sure. there is a lot of work involved in getting the apprenticeship. I've just written down here, craft apprenticeship. I think a craft apprenticeship would cover a number of different disciplines rather than specifically one, because as I said, it's a small enough industry. Can it be sustained? The amount of work that goes into creating this whole program and all that and can it be sustained on a small mm -hmm. island that is it sustainable that can we go on just to reassure as well in Germany they're finding quite hard to get apprentices as well because people see the the ring of the big job sitting at a desk and not having to do a whole pile of physical work is also that catch there as well but there is the tide is turning which is wonderful to see here and I think if there was some kind of a, a general apprenticeship which is a new program which could be formed and then you could specialise in one or two different particular ideas of learning which would be a much better, almost like say an arts degree and then you can specialise in different things, a general apprenticeship. If that was possible, now I don't know at the moment, maybe the model has to be changed. I think the, you could do that taster kind of mm. experiencing bit Pre, you know, apprenticeship is the, the, I suppose the challenge with the actual apprent and a, a formal apprenticeship is that it's it's a designated mm. activity, so it's an occupation-based approach. But that's not to stop that kind of other, you know, this, it's, it, you know, apprenticeship can be one of a range of kind of solutions in this whole area. You know, you've got a traineeship, you've got taster mm. courses, you've got maybe, you know, you know, a, like a whole range of offerings. And we know there's already existing provision as well. And it's where apprenticeship can add value and, you know, and can really assist the industry in growing. And as you say, Emmett, sustaining, you know, keeping those skills going and, you know, building them for the future as well. And one of the biggest things we could also say is we're sustainable. In the world of sustainability, we are working with sustainable natural products. We're the, one of the most sustainable industries out there. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so very, very much, uh, Dr. Mary Liz Trant. And um, before uh, Mary Liz goes, if anybody would like to ask a question uh, from the audience or to make any comments, then we would welcome that. Yes. Oh, 
Ocean Chip. Originally, and tying those two, tying it in as an industry rather, not just so much as a craft, but as an entire industry. Um, and I think that even earlier on, we were talking about the circularity and the, the wool industry, for example. That's, that's another example of, you know, the wool that's being, that the, the garments are being made from is not Irish wool. And how do you address that? And how do you take that back a step and generate the interest in whatever is needed there to, to get wool, Irish wool into Irish garments and, yeah. and make them truly Irish. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah and that, I, yes, I think you know, that's a really valid point and I think that's actually, that could come down to the design of the modules that's actually presented within the apprenticeship. So we would have a whole piece on indigenous products and use um, that could be linked up or potentially be aligned to skills that are endangered. Um, so there would be a piece of work actually setting out the overall apprenticeship that it would be become part it would become part of it. Yeah, and I suppose then the opportunity for you know building programs even, you know, whether they're apprenticeships or other programs that would actually start to really, you know, provide, you know, build that whole part of the, the, the chain of, man you know, production and manufacturing. Not, you know, that, you know, yeah, I suppose it's about starting somewhere and then building, you know, and, and I think absolutely, I think the point you're making is, you know, down the chain and you create more jobs back down at, the, at that level and, and it becomes then a very viable industry throughout. Yeah, yeah. and it's actually having a, worth having a look. We, there is a manufacturing technician and a manufacturing engineering apprenticeship that spans right across all industries. So they, you know, any kind of production and manufacturing can be, can, you know, it can apply to. So there might even be something there already that could be adapted quite easily, you know, in that area, as well as kind of having it an integral part of any new apprenticeship that comes along. I yeah. think to go back to what you were saying and what we were talking about this morning with the wool and the sourcing of the wool here and the production here, um, you know, there's a whole provenance piece that needs to happen. And the best way to do that is probably through the educational system. So I suppose that you, Design and Craft Academy, is well positioned to do some work around that and then to feed that through into the, into the overall programs. Yeah, yeah. Great. The financial side of the apprenticeships, which yeah. has always been an issue that I've been trying to figure out. Um, I'm a maker myself, not far from Emmet. Um, so, do you you operate under education? So, so we're, we're yeah. So um, the National Apprenticeship Office is an it's an organisation of both the HEA and SOLAS, which parent department is the Department of Further and Higher Education. And yeah. if, if at the, currently you, there's an offering of up to €2,000 a year for an employee to take on an apprentice. Yeah, uh, €2,000 per apprentice per year. So, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you probably have to pay an apprentice 25 grand a year, would it be? It, it varies. It varies. Which, but it's, you know, it, it can go up or down. But, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's only a contribution at okay, the moment. Okay, and yeah. I don't know how much research is out there on what the average... Sort of people in craft are earning, but it's significantly lower, obviously, than tech or you know construction or any of these other industries. Yeah. So, is there a possibility for a greater financial support within the craft sector? Because it's it, the, you know it's it, it's hard to put a value on what we do. Yeah. You know, when you arrive in at Dublin Airport for years, all you saw was pictures of craftspeople welcoming you in, and you're like, okay, this is what the people who arrive into Ireland see. Yeah. You know, so there we, we have a value, yeah. but financially we we don't have such a great contribution. Yeah. So is there a way 
if it's seen as further education, is there a way that there can be greater financial support for the apprenticeships and craft? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I think it's a really, a really good question. Um, there isn't a fixed salary. You know, it depends from industry to industry, and generally it reflects, you know, a kind of the average of kind of somebody entering the industry. But obviously, it has to be attractive for somebody, and they have to want to, and you know, it has to be affordable for the employer. I mean, I, I think I suppose. There's a, it's, it's, it's a kind of a system issue, you know, so at the moment that's, there's, you know, that's what the government is providing on a kind of across the board. Um, I think it'd probably be an important conversation, you know, as part of deciding is this an attractive proposition for employers? Is it realistic? Is it feasible? You know, uh, you know and, and, you know, if, if the financial element of it isn't, well then, you know, then it's maybe looking at other opportunities, or, you know, whether it's traineeships or you know something that is work-based but not as structured and not as much of a requirement on employers. But I just think it's something that's probably an important question you're raising that would need to be thought through, because ultimately, you know, apprenticeships have to be in demand. You know, they have to make sense to employers. You know, to, that it's worth it. You know, and it's worth it in terms of investment of time, you know, investment of effort, investment of finances. The bottom line you know, that actually this is going to pay dividends, you know, so don't have a, I don't have a, a nice answer or solution for you, but it's, no, it's a very good question. Yeah. In the ideal world, uh, the craftsperson probably should be paid to take on an apprentice. <laughs> That's what would have happened 500 years ago. Yeah. There was this thing about Cleary's years ago, and they said you had to go and pay to join Cleary's to do your apprenticeship, wow. to serve your time. So maybe we have to reimagine the model that the apprentice will get paid, but also the trainer will get paid yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and I think if that, something like that, it will make it a lot easier. As I said, our industry is very, very cyclical, and some of us probably live below the minimum wage, mm. and if we worked it out, that's what we're, we're wanting on it, and we don't, we should never expect anyone to be, to be living on that. But we do it because we love it, because we're making, it's crazy, it's not because we're going to become millionaires, yeah. Um, but we are leaving a legacy probably behind us and I look around this building, this was built by craftspeople and it's a fantastic piece of, of craftsmanship after 200 years. And, and I think that's the huge opportunity now with the new academy mm. and this focus you know, that Mary Jo and colleagues are going to be leading mm. on looking at how to make education and training opportunities sustainable mm. you know, for both apprentices or learners but also for those who are supporting and kind of trying to keep keep these skills going, you know, so I, I think, you know, yeah, I think it's, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's an important it's an one to highlight. Time. Yeah, very exciting. So thank you so very, very much for coming along today. Thank you to everybody for listening. And um, we look forward to speaking to you all again soon. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.